and momentarily. Good afternoon and welcome to today's very special webinar. My name is Ken Levinson, the Executive Director of WIDA, and I'll be moderating today's discussion. Before we get to today's event, we'd like to mention a couple of upcoming events at WIDA. Tomorrow morning at 9.30 a.m., we're hosting an event to discuss U.S. trade with Central America and, and the immigration crisis on the U.S. southern border. And next week, we'll continue our series on trade and the environment. Uh, both uh, information on both events can be found at our website, www.wita.org. For those of you who've been on a WIDA webinar before, you know that we like to call out the names of some of those you are in community with at today's event, even if you can't see them on Zoom. So welcome today to Amanda Haran at MetLife, Ellen House at the US Department of Commerce, Bill Stokes with the George C. Marshall International Center, Michael Maybach with the James Wilson Institute and the former head of the European American Business Council, and Rolf Lundberg with Choice Hotels International. Welcome Amanda, Ellen, Bill, Michael, and Rolf. We're also delighted to welcome our event partner today, the Friedrich Naumann Foundation. For those of you in the WIDA world who are not familiar with the Friedrich Naumann Foundation, they share a political philosophy with the German Free Democratic Party and its work is supported by the German Foreign Ministry. In Washington, their work is led by my dear friend, Klaus Gramko. Klaus? Uh, thank you, Ken. Uh, you have been my trade guru since uh, you first participated in one of our study trips to Germany a long time ago. I'm not going to say uh, the years when you worked as a legislative assistant for Senator Nelson Rockefeller. For those who know you, know John D. Rockefeller. John D. Rockefeller. The John nephew. D. Rockefeller. Sorry, Nelson said it was his father. <laughs> Sorry, uh, I want to welcome uh, our panelists and extend a, a special welcome to my chairman, uh, Professor Karl-Heinz Parquet. And this is a truly a, a global event. Our fa father's participant sits in Vilnius, uh, Professor Parquet in Magdeburg, and then of course, uh, uh, Berlin and Washington DC. Uh, I'm also very happy that you, uh, we could do this uh, webinar with my colleague, Thomas Elka, whom you will see later and who will can uh, introduce. One of the constant subject we talked on transatlantic relations uh, is and was the importance of free trade. Um, in all my work, trade relations were always full of tensions over the years. This was especially true, of course, for the last four years. One of the most important items in the new transatlantic dialogue agenda is a constructive restart of trade talks and relations. This event fits very perfect into the annual theme of the foundation that the board set for our work in Germany, but all around the world. And it's called Restart Social Market Economy. So let's talk about how we could successfully restart this process. Ken, thank you very much for your cooperation and your moderation. And hopefully when Professor Parquet will be in Washington the next time in person, you all invited across the street from Weeder in the Willard for a nice lunch. And we do this again. Uh, Katrina, you are also very welcome then to come to Washington. So thank you, Ken. And uh, well, 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 I'm looking forward to an interesting uh, conversation. Uh, thank you very much, Klaus. Uh, you are a long time and dear friend. I will say it's been over almost 30 years since we first met, so it, it has been quite a while. And thank you for helping bring this transatlantic dialogue uh, to WIDA today, but also over the years. As Klaus mentioned, we have three very special guests who've joined us for this important dialogue. I won't provide lengthy introductions of our guests. You should have received their biographies in the event program we sent to everyone earlier today. Welcome today to Katrina Hamashivichene. I'm not sure if I said that exactly properly, but I'm working on it. The acting head of the economics department at the Central Bank of Lithuania and a professor of political economy at Vilnius University coming to us from Vilnius. 
Uh, Dr. Carl Heinz Paquet, a professor of international economics at the Otto van Gerke University in Magdeburg and chairman of the board of the Friedrich Naumann Foundation coming to us from Germany. And my old friend, Marjorie Chorlins, the senior vice president of European affairs at the US Chamber of Commerce, who has many years of experience in government, business, civil society coming to us from Washington. So welcome Katrina, Carl Heinz and Marjorie. Uh, the way I want to run the conversation today is maybe put out some topics, go around the room, get your thoughts on those. So first one I want to tackle sort of the big, uh, as we like to say, the elephant in the room, um, America's re-engagement with Europe and the world. Um, President uh, Biden has pledged to restore America's global leadership and re-engage with global institutions. At the Munich Security Conference in March, uh, President Biden focused on cooperating with the EU in a struggle of democracies versus autocracy, autocracies and coming up with a shared strategy on China. Meanwhile, Europe recently concluded a comprehensive agreement on investment with China, which is hung up, I believe, in the European Parliament today for a variety of reasons, including human rights in Xinjiang and uh, China's extraterritorial legal actions against European legislators. I'm not even sure if Americans are that aware of this issue that's come up recently. Um, in Denmark, uh, two parliamentarians invited a uh, Chinese dissident to come visit uh, uh, Denmark for meetings. He then, um, after leaving Denmark, I think sought exile in the UK. And China is now using some of their extraterritorial laws to try to bring charges against the Danish parliamentarians who've uh, never even left Denmark uh, for this. So there's a lot going on um, with uh, US and China relations and EU and China relations. Um, you know, I think I just as a place to start and maybe Carl Heinz, I'll come to you first. You know, is it realistic for the US and EU to pursue a unified approach on China? Or is the best we can hope for a, loosely al a loose alignment of goals? Well, let me first uh, thank you very much for uh, uh, being invited to participate uh, in this uh, digital event. Uh, I hope someday we get back to uh, uh, analogous uh, formats, but for the time being, uh, the excellent organization uh, that you provide for us uh, is very much appreciated. So thank you very much uh, for um, uh, organizing this whole thing. But now uh, back to the topic. Let me first... Uh, uh, let me first uh, say that the, uh, we, uh, this meeting is well-timed. Uh, it takes place uh, 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 on a good day. Uh, Lloyd Austin uh, today uh, is in Berlin uh, and uh, he gave another signal, uh, signal beyond what we were saying about uh, Biden's position expressed in Munich um, uh, with respect to uh, German-American uh, 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 relationship. You, uh, uh, Trump, uh, President Trump had uh, announced uh, a partial withdrawal uh, of uh, uh, American uh, military uh, presence in uh, Germany, and that has been now completely revised, and it has turned into a, a marginal uh, extension of this presence. And this is a very important signal. I just want to say that because we are probably talking more about economics today than about security matters. But please don't forget this. This is a very important psychology, political psychology, uh, the presence uh, of Americans in uh, Germany and the trust. Of course, this is a two way game. And when the Americans say we stay uh, uh, and uh, we revise our former uh, position, then uh, uh, the Germans uh, and others uh, uh, must also deliver uh, in terms of uh, an appropriate level of defense spending. So uh, we shall see. Uh, I, I just want to make the point that uh, we are not only in economic matters here. We are really in the deep uh, and extremely important uh, uh, waters of politics, uh, of geopolitics, uh, of military presence, uh, and of course of trade economics. Now, let me come to China. You started with China. China is always the elephant in the room, uh, whatever you talk about at the moment. Um, let me make a personal remark first. You may have heard that our foundation 
had had an had had an office in Hong Kong, and it has to close down. It had to close down the office because our work uh, could not be uh, pr pursued in the way we are we are accustomed to. You know, in a, in, a, in a free way, choosing our own partners, going our way uh, of uh, filling uh, a foreign a presence in a foreign country with life. And that is, of course, due to the security laws that were passed la last year. So we were the, uh, we, we were the first uh, foundation, to, uh, German political foundation to leave Hong Kong. Uh, but uh, uh, from that, you can, uh, you can figure out how skeptical we are about uh, the state of the matters in the country, in China, uh, the uh, the pressure that China puts on uh, Hong Kong and now also increasingly and very worryingly the pressure it it uh, it uh, puts on uh, uh, Taiwan. Uh, that said, uh, this may be um, something like an idiosyncratic liberal position because this is not uh, the uh, the overall mood in Germany as a whole yet, and I don't think. Uh, uh, a fortiori, I don't think that it is the uh, the common mood in Europe. Uh, we have for much too long, we have uh, uh, lived in a kind of illusion with respect to China. The illusion being uh, that uh, the Chinese want to really move towards a, a genuine uh, liberal market economy. This is not the case. This is a state capitalist system with uh, a technological urge which is used for geopolitical political, uh, po political uh, uh, aims uh, uh, and targets which have nothing to do with economics proper and uh, the wonderful questions of an optimal division of labor in the world of free trade uh, and fair trade. Uh, so um, uh, people begin to realize in the last few years they're just in the process of beginning to realize, apart from the extreme political left, which will never understand it, uh, and uh, the extreme political right, which would never understand it either. But the general political establishment in Germany is beginning to realize that you can't go on the way you did before. And so uh, that uh, closer cooperation with America is extremely important uh, to put pressure on China uh, and uh, to, to find a reasonable uh, um, path for the future. But I'm still a bit skeptical. This is going to take years to uh, to mature into a, 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 a cooperation uh, which, uh, which will really be effective uh, in uh, uh, keeping uh, China at bay. Thank you. Thank you. No, that's great. And, you know, I, I meant to open by asking you how are things... Uh, how are you and how are things in Germany right now related to COVID and, and the recovery? Should I say a few words on COVID? Please. Yeah. Please. <laughs> Please. I, I, meant to, me. I meant to open with that, but I, I was you so enthusiastic. To, I just You, you don't right know in. what you're doing. You, uh, <laughs> I, you truncate me uh, early on. Uh, no, I mean, uh, in Germany, it's a very odd situation. We had a relatively good year by international standards uh, with respect to COVID in 2020. And we have an absolutely miserable year 21. Um, which is, there's one major elephant in the room. This is the problem that we don't have enough vaccine, which is a disaster for a country like Germany compared to the United States, compared to Israel, uh, compared to the United Kingdom. Um, um, so uh, we pay for quite a bit of arrogance uh, in this respect. But beyond that, um, the whole uh, organization has been an absolute mess in the last few weeks. Uh, and the trust in the government, and nothing is more important than trust in a situation like this, uh, is, uh, went down the drain. And that, that is one of the reasons why we observe these odd things which happen at the moment in the Christian Democratic Party, party which you observe from America uh, carefully as well. But I stop here, and as a liberal, I should stop here. <laughs> well, thank you, Carl Heinz. Um, we, we certainly understand there's been a lot of anxiety over those issues here. I, we let Marjorie jump in in a minute on that. But Katrina, I'd like to turn to you. Um, I guess I'll reverse the order of the discussion slightly. How are things in Lithuania and Vilnius 
related to the pandemic um, I, and, and, and how are you doing? So hello, and uh, first of all, thank you very much for having me in this discussion. It's really a pleasure and an honor to be here with all the other panelists. And regarding the pandemics, um, I must say it's some, it's, the story is similar to Germany's. So we had quite a good year in 2020. In fact, we are almost the best in terms of GDP uh, within European Union. But then in the end of the year, we had a, a strong rise of the second wave. And then uh, we had election coming. So this also postponed uh, a strict lockdown and now we are in like lockdown since December like the restaurants are closed and supermarkets are closed and uh, we ma managed to reduce the second wave but now we are like moving into a third wave while still sitting in the lockdown so people are really tired everybody is disappointed with the government and yeah so vaccination is the hope and we have yeah now around 20% of the population vaccinated. So yeah, it's too slow. Sorry to hear that. Uh, we it, wish it's you, too we slow, wish but you it's, it's faster than Germany. <laughs> yeah, it's a little bit faster than Germany. But I mean, in the EU, it's um, quite a similar pace for most of the countries. I mean, it's um, envious to watch Israel yeah. Having almost all the population vaccinated. Yeah, they, they just said um, today they're delaying their uh, the FDA is pausing uh, distribution of the Johnson and Johnson vaccine now because of a clotting issue that seems to resemble the AstraZeneca mm. issue that uh, has risen. Same type of um, incidence level, uh, one in a million. Um, very low, but it's almost exclusively in women under the age of 60, I believe. So um, it's still it's still a concern, and I know a bigger concern even in Europe, where you've had to rely on the AstraZeneca and the, the J and J as well. Um, uh, but Katrina, back to the uh, topic at hand. Um, uh, we were talking about U.S. reengagement and the challenge of working together on China. Um, any thoughts on that? Yeah, so I was thinking, you know, what I can add in this discussion, uh, being from Lithuania, and um, I, I thought, you know, like, if we think about uh, trade policy, like international trade policy, there are always like three areas to consider for a politician going into those agreements, right? So you have to think about, uh, okay, first of all, we have free trade, which brings its benefits. So yeah, it, it makes everybody better off you know, the comparative advantage and the economies of scale and so on. But then uh, you also have to consider domestic policies, like the way you share the pie inside the country, right? And those policies uh, actually affect your competitiveness internationally. So you have to balance among those things. And the third thing is uh, national security issues. And the trade policy for sure is an instrument um, taking care of national security issues. And um, when I think about all those uh, most important international organizations, they were all founded after the Second World War, right? And then uh, all the Western countries had a very strong feeling that uh, national security issues are very important. It is very important to cooperate and to, you know, to ensure that uh, the democratic values prevail and uh, to agree on them. And now I think that like, you know, uh, more than 70 years of relatively peace and wealthy life uh, makes uh, the, the societies and the politicians in the Western countries um, to pay less attention to the national security issues and to pay much more attention to uh, economic welfare and then uh, just to search for the benefits of, of the free trade and then, okay, to balance it a bit with the domestic uh, unsatisfaction of the workers. Um, uh, but I think for us as Lithuania is only 30 years away from occupation of the Soviet Union, we still have a really strong feeling that uh, international organizations are very important to, to make us secure. And uh, you know that 
our next door neighbor is Belarus, where we see things happening today. And uh, Ukraine is also not that far away. So we really feel that uh, threat constantly. And therefore, you know, and I remember still that during the Soviet occupation, there was always hope that, you know, America, Western countries are, are going to help us or are going to secure the, the, you know, the democratic values in the world. So I think it is really, really important to, to pay enough attention to this cooperation and to, um, despite some, you know, differences, uh, let's say between the US and EU, despite the differences in like social policy understanding or, okay, climate change, also we have different views, but, uh, um, to, to keep in mind that uh, what we have in common is actually more important, the, the, the basic fundamental values of democracy, rule of law, you know, human rights, and w- there are not so many other partners in the world where we can cooperate on those things. Uh, thank you. Thank you for tying some of those things together. I, you know, Carl Heinz started by talking about uh, the, the U.S. recommitment on Germany and the security issues. And, um, you know, I think, you know, it, it, it's a good transition for me to reach out to Marjorie. Um, she and I both started our work in Washington, I think around the same time when the Cold War was coming to an end, um, when uh, Lithuania was still in the Soviet orbit, when uh, the wall was coming down and things were changing and, you know, some people were saying it was the end of history. Um, Sadly, I think it wasn't. Um, History has decided that it it, it, uh, is playing some cruel jokes on us by coming back to us in so many ways. Um, uh, Not not the least of which, of course, the pandemic, Um, uh, almost a hundred years exactly from the last time there was a global pandemic. Uh, Marjorie, uh, your thoughts on I know I, I don't need to ask you how things are doing in the U.S. It's uh, thankfully Carl Heinz and Katrina. We're doing a little better right now. I think in the U.S. on the COVID front, we certainly have hot spots uh, popping up around the United States. But the mm-hmm. vaccine is is certainly accelerating. The the J and J problem of today is certainly going to slow things down a bit. But there, you know, we've seen a massive increase. Marjorie, I think said you said you got your shot a couple weeks ago. Your first. I did. I did. So, uh, so Ken, first off, yeah. thank you uh, uh, to you and the, the team at the Frederick Norman Foundation for in, uh, inviting me to join. It's a pleasure to share the stage, obviously, with Katrina and Carl Hines, uh, who I've just met, uh, but consider now good friends. Um, look, I think that, uh, I think Katrina did a really good job of laying out sort of the three pillars of sort of political consideration uh, when thinking about <clears throat> global issues, right? So trade, the domestic agenda, national security. <clears throat> I would say that, and those are issues that have been there even back when you and I were sort of babes in arms uh, looking at trade in the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the, the fact pattern was a little bit different, but the issues were still very much the same. Uh, there have been some changes, obviously, since then, especially here in the U.S., I would say a notable change has been the evolution of the political landscape as it relates to trade. Um, there's been, and also national security. Um, but we find ourselves now in this circumstance where all three of these issues are colliding. I would add to the mix uh, climate change uh, as another significant uh, factor in how countries are sorting through uh, what their policies will be. So. So I think we, we, we are looking at a very interesting time. I think that the Biden administration, the president is making good on his early commitment to re-engage with international institutions um, and to reach out to our allies. <clears throat> Some of his earliest calls obviously <clears throat> were with European leaders and other members of the cabinet have followed up in, in similar fashion. <clears throat> He's recommitted to going into Paris and so on and so forth. So, So there is good action to back up the initial rhetoric. The question is, where do we go from here? Um, Now you picked probably the single biggest topic, probably apart from from climate and COVID, um, 
where the US and Europe, I would argue, have to figure out how to work more closely together. And they are, it is a challenging uh, situation. Carl Heinz talked about some of this, Katrina as well, some of the differences that exist between the US and European perspectives vis-a-vis -vis China. Um, obviously, we have, um, you know, Europe has sort of uh, a different trade and investment exposure among the member states. Uh, so there is sort of an evolving debate, I think, in Europe about how to position vis-a-vis -vis China. There was obviously a revised China strategy that came out a while ago, uh, but I think that's still very much a, a work in progress. Um, there are also obviously, especially in the face of the pandemic, you know, uh, a greater willingness on both sides of the Atlantic to want to invest government resources in improving competitiveness. So that obviously creates a different dynamic as well. Um, so, so then the question is, and, and we do have differences of opinion about, about a number of issues, but the question is, is it possible for us to work together um, in ways that will respect uh, the very uh, tenets that we all hold dear and also recognize the, chal the challenge, both commercial and um, security challenge that China represents, because the fact is they do. Um, we would argue that, you know, there, there is an opportunity. I mean, if you look at the panoply of, of policy options out there, <clears throat> excuse me, whether you're talking about investment screening or export controls or uh, subsidies policy, data, competition, et cetera, there are opportunities and there should be a concerted effort for the US and EU to look at um, how we might be able to coalesce a little bit more. I would argue that, you know, in order for us to do that, we have some serious outstanding trade disputes, obviously we need to settle, um, but we should be able to look and see, you know, where can we um, harmonize? Um, and if we can't harmonize on some of these fronts, what does, um, uh, what does coordination look like? Um, I mean, you've seen a little bit of that, I think, with, with um, uh, you see some of the moves in that direction vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, toughening up export screening, I'm um, sorry, investment screening measures as well as export control. So I do think there is an opportunity there. Um, and I think, frankly, the politics in the US also are evolving in a way that makes it all the more imperative for uh, for the US and Europe to find ways to work together. Well, thank you, Marjorie. And yeah, I, I, I guess I should apologize. We just dove right into all the big problems, COVID, China. Um, but I'm, you know, I'm gonna dig in a little bit deeper, if I might, on the national security uh, related issues. And we're gonna get to the strictly more bilateral issues in this conversation too. Don't wanna let folks think that we're gonna skip that. But um, thinking about the nexus between national security and trade, um, you know, there is a lot of question as Marjorie raised about dual use technologies um, that go both ways. The adaption of technologies developed in the West that might be used to promote China's military capabilities and their domestic surveillance capa capacities, uh, which also goes to the question of the democracies versus the autocracies. And then uh, technology developed in China that might undermine security and privacy in the West. Um, you know, the question that, you know, how do we, you know, Huawei is still an issue, but what's the next Huawei? Um, obviously for both Germany and Lithuania, the legacy of a surveillance state is one that is uh, fresh in the minds of, you know, many people still um, who lived through it. Um, whether, you know, and, and that goes back, you know, couple generations of people still living who remember those days. So, you know, and that's what we're seeing, of course, you know, on a grand scale with the use of these technologies in China. Um, Carl Hines, um, you know, come back around to you. You know, what are your thoughts on, on how we balance this, uh, this nexus between, you know, the interests of countries to engage in trade and companies and the interests of the people and privacy and security? Well, it's an extremely difficult question in practice. In theory, I have a, a, a relatively simple answer. <laughs> the simple answer is that we have to face the fact that our values as they are, 
the values that we share transatlantically are different ones from uh, the uh, um, uh, the outlook uh, of uh, uh, autocratic systems uh, like uh, China, like uh, Russia. Uh, and uh, um, for that matter, we also have to uh, uh, have to deal <laughs> asymmetrically uh, with the threats. Uh, I remember a few uh, a few years ago when it came uh, when it turned out that uh, there was uh, um, spying of uh, Amer uh, Americans in Germany. There was a great, a huge discussion we had about this. And I'm sometimes a little bit surprised how uh, uh, how how uh, low the level of attention is uh, to to what China does uh, and how China systematically infiltrates uh, our informational systems, or at least try to do so. And as I said in my introductory statement. Uh, my feeling is that we still have a long way to go to hammer this into the heads uh, uh, of uh, people in general uh, and uh, in uh, also and in particular businessmen. Uh, you know, um, you have to figure out that the last 20 years in Germany were a time when business with China had enormous growth rates. Uh, it, is, uh, it was the big success story at the margin was not trade with America, <laughs> was not trade with uh, with democratic countries, but the big success story was China. Um, so, um, and I, I, I tell the story for Germany, but, but I could tell the same story even in a more accentuated fashion for Italy, uh, for Hungary maybe, for Greece. Think of remember what uh, the uh, when Greece was uh, uh, in dire straits at the beginning of la the last decade, and uh, there was a lot of capital from China flowing into Greece. So that Piraeus, uh, the harbor or uh, the port of uh, Athens, extremely important, not only uh, economically but also strategically. Well, to say uh, to, to say the least, there is a strong Chinese influence now, we, and we have we have the Chinese already at the negotiation table in uh, uh, in Brussels. So uh, what what I'm saying is basically it's a matter of a general sensitivity with respect to the issue, and then unfortunately in the four Trump years. Um, uh, you know, um, Trump, uh, President Trump was not the right one uh, to uh, raise this level of sensitivity uh, in Europe and in Germany in particular, because how he dealt with China was not always the smartest way. Um, and uh, um, uh, this is why um, we lost a couple of years. We lost a couple of years in a constructive way of dealing with, dealing with China. By the way, we want to trade with China. China is a hugely important country. I want to see China developing. I want to see that society not, not to be impoverished, not to be cut out of a, as an alien from international trade. But we have to obey the rules. And they are a member of the WTO. Uh, they, if you look carefully what they do in the WTO, they are massively violating the rules. And who can help to bring them back to the rules? Um, this is the only, uh, the only powers in the world who have the, uh, the economic cloud to do so. It's very simple. It's uh, America or North America, including the Canadians, of course, uh, uh, plus Europe. So uh, we have a huge challenge, but I don't have a simple recipe. Thank you. I, I, sadly, I don't think anyone does. Uh, Katrina, um, if I can dig in a little more with you about um, this, uh, and we're gonna get to WTO questions shortly as well. But Katrina, about the, you know, you mentioned that your three pillars, you know, the benefits of free trade, um, how the pie is shared and the national security aspect. Um, you know, those are questions we're talking about in the United States as well. Uh, President Biden's build back better and wanting to have a, a trade policy that we, as we, he called it, worker-centric trade policy. So those are certainly questions that we can, I might have, dig in a little with Marjorie on, but Katrina, about the security aspects. Now, how is that something that, that's viewed in Lithuania and 
But how are you talking about that when you're teaching your courses? So I think, um, okay, if you ask me from a uh, university uh, teacher perspective, <laughs> it's, uh, uh, I, I should quote some theory, theoretical things like, you know, national security is a market failure, is one of example that you give to the students that, okay, free markets is great. They work great uh, in allocating resources, most efficiently achieving uh, the best results, but there are market failures, right? There are things that markets can't take care of. And I think national security is a great example. It is something that no private business, no commercial interest will care enough about to, to do something about it, right? And therefore, we need public authorities to take care of it. Therefore, we need national states, and therefore, we also need international cooperation. And I think... Um, it's the same in, in, in Germany or US or in Lithuania that our private businesses, of course, they, they see the benefits of uh, trade with, uh, would it be Russia or China? And they, they would happily reap this, those benefits and uh, not care too much about, about uh, any security issues. And, um, I think for the politicians, it's also a, a difficult task to, to accomplish uh, any regulations uh, which are against business interests, right? Because they, they always have the pressure from the business community, which is strong and which are, of course, they, they affect the, the political decisions. But I think international, um, international agreements, international cooperation is one good instrument uh, to ensure those policies. At least in Lithuania, I see that very much that we, for example, okay, Lithuanian business or Lithuanian society in general also are not very, very um, uh, aware about climate change. But then we say like, okay, this is EU rule. This is EU policy. What, do, what can you do? You have to obey. And I think it's one good instrument for also for a national politician to say like, okay, sorry, I want to be good for my local business people, but it's an international agreement, right? So I think it, we need strong political leaders and we need international agreement on those issues because nobody will personally or from commercial interest take care of those issues. Uh, really, really interesting perspective. You know, I was, you made me start thinking with climate change in Lithuania, it might be a garden hotspot in the next century. Uh, we'll all be spending our summer vacations there. Um, Marjorie, um, you know, thoughts on um, kind of the, the balancing act that the business community in the U.S. has certainly played. And, and um, you know, the chamber has been at the forefront of, you know, some of the reforms, I think, that were taking place on um, our foreign export control laws. I know that uh, you're, you're our Europe expert uh, at the chamber as well, but I know um, there's a nexus on all these things about working together and, and, and thoughts on, on how you think we balance those things going forward. Sure. So Ken, when you and I were coming up and China was just beginning to emerge as a, as a locus for uh, American investment, there was a debate that happened. This was in the early 90s, right? Around how do you balance uh, trade with China the, the, and the obvious opportunities there with concerns about um, environment and labor and human rights. Um, obviously, that debate has evolved dramatically in the last 20 years, um, and, and it has become more of a focus on national security. Quite, quite legitimately, we're focused on that. Um, and, and I think the lines are blurred more than we ever might have expected. So I think it really is a challenge for policymakers to, um, to strike that right balance between you know, promoting trade and commerce on the one hand, which is essential, right? For renewed American competitiveness and growth and jobs and so on um, with the national security imperative on the other, which, which I consider perfectly legitimate. The question is, how do, you, how do you manage that balance? Individual companies obviously are gonna make decisions based on their own unique uh, uh, needs, how they balance uh, the full panoply of, of concerns by their various stakeholders. Um, but I do think that it is in Europe and the US's interest to try to, try to work together. The chamber uh, 
I think earlier this year, um, issued a report on decoupling trends um, in the US, uh, in particular vis-a-vis -vis China. And the purpose of putting it out was basically to, to, to indicate to policymakers, look, here's some of what's happening, here's where that's <clears throat> a good thing, and here's where that may be challenging if you go too far. So the question really is, how do you strike that balance? And I think, you know, I think more companies are attuned today to the fact that it is a complicated landscape, um, um, in part because of some of China's behaviors as far as, as far as cyber and things like that, where they've been directly affected. So, so it's definitely um, more front of mind for business, um, but I, I don't think we necessarily have come up with the right formula uh, where you balance all of those competing interests. So thanks, Marjorie. So thinking of competing interests and thinking of balance, uh, Carl Hines, I'm gonna come back to uh, the WTO. Um, this is a place where we can certainly, the United States and Europe, as you mentioned, can work together. I would add uh, North America, as you, you clarified, and uh, I would add Japan to that as well. Um, uh, you're muted, by the way. Um, but uh, what do you, uh, what areas do you see uh, where the U.S. and Europe can work together constructively on the multilateral stage? And we're going to get to bilateral in a minute, but on the multilateral stage, uh, uh, climate change maybe, and and WTO. Uh, just your thoughts on on those two. Well, I think if if you look at the WTO uh, as a uh, multilateral organization. Uh, before you start, uh, before we start complaining about the need for reform, <laughs> which is absolutely right, one should uh, uh, make uh, uh, make it clear that this is an extremely successful organization. Uh, if you um, uh, pick the history of the WTO since 1995. Uh, or if you go even further back to the um, to the the history of the GATT since 1947, um, this is an enormous success. You know, uh, 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 more than 90% of world trade is covered uh, by countries of the WTO. We have more than uh, more than 160 um, members. What other international organization has a record like that? If you measure it by the standards of its early aims, you know, lowering tariffs uh, and uh, making globalization possible. Uh, and uh, especially since 1990, this success has been tremendous, of course, with the Eastern European countries uh, getting out of their isolation finally, uh, and India and China uh, opening up. It's a great, great story, but, the world has changed with it. And to some extent, the WTO is, uh, is victim of its own success. You know, when uh, uh, tariffs on uh, industrial products, for instance, uh, between the United States and uh, Europe and uh, uh, um, uh, are already relatively low. So, and it's much easier to negotiate about a couple of tariffs <laughs> than to negotiate about standards, about uh, business behavior, about knowledge creation, uh, uh, and all the uh, the different types of violations that are possible through the back door. But even there, uh, you uh, you know you have at least the dispute settlement procedure, uh, which has which has been set up uh, since the 1990s and has has worked nicely. Many cases which have uh, uh, have uh, gone to. Uh, uh, to, to court have been solved. Um, more, we have, have had uh, uh, something like 500 cases since the foundation uh, uh, of this uh, mechanism. This is roughly uh, one every two weeks. <laughs> uh, and uh, it works so well that you don't hear about most of them uh, in the world press very much. Uh, and that goes on and on. So um, uh, it would be a pity if that, if that uh, uh, if the, 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 the asset of an internationally working system would be destroyed. And in this respect, of course, Trump has done a very bad job, you know, 
uh, th there is obviously a bottleneck. Uh, we don't have enough judges. Uh, uh, we have uh, a dispute settlement which go uh, has uh, quite often trespassed. The Americans are right on that. Uh, it's uh, uh, limits of interpretation of legal interpretation. But that is, uh, I could name other defects, but this is a matter of negotiation of reforming uh, the thing and putting more judges into it. So th that shouldn't, shouldn't be that complicated if you really want to, to do it and, if, it, and, and if America and Europe uh, push in the same direction. And the second big area is, of course, uh, the big question is whether we, in the traditional form, we need for, further really multilateral agreements in the extremely broad sense that we have them today. The organization has simply become too big. Much negotiations has uh, uh, have, have moved anyway on the plurilateral uh, and the bilateral uh, 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 stage and uh, bilateral and, and plurilateral agreements have prolifer have been ha uh, 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 very very numerous uh, in the last two decades. So why not build a, a, a new framework for, of open clubs, if you like, if you like, uh, that uh, you uh, you allow much more. Uh, dynamic movement in plurilateral and bilateral negotiations, but keep the system open within the WTO and let the WTO make the surveillance. So um, we could go on, there is a whole table full of reform proposals, uh, but what is still lacking is the political will to do this together. And I tell you that the will can only come from America and from Europe together. And then others will join, I'm pretty sure. Uh, well, also, I'm not talking about Australia or New Zealand. We have good friends everywhere, democratic friends. But uh, uh, the push has to come from America and Europe. And it is high time to, st uh, to start with that. And I think we have an historic opportunity with the signals that Biden is setting now. Uh, I think we should right on going uh, start and start working. I, I think there's, a, there's certainly a lot. I can see Marjorie's ready to jump out of her chair about her enthusiasm uh, for, <laughs> for that. Uh, but I'm going to turn to Katrina. Uh, thoughts on working uh, cooperatively in these multilateral fora um, on uh, WTO and on climate change, which you raised earlier. What are any thoughts you can share from your perspective? Yeah, I couldn't agree more with uh, Professor Carl Heinz. Um, that really, I, I also agree that uh, this is very important to have this framework. And we saw this, for example, in the Brexit negotiations. So when it was always uh, going like, okay, we, we might negotiate a, a soft Brexit, but in case of hard Brexit, it will return to WTO um, agreement, right? So it's, it will not return into nothingness, into wild uh, West, you know, it's still like the basic rules are the WTO agreement. And uh, I think it is very important to, to keep this at least fundamental agreement, you know, to, to have at least some basic rules um, trying to assure this uh, level play field uh, in the international trade. And um, yeah, and I, I totally agree that the, the EU and US are are those partners which are which are the most important to trying to 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 keep this order if we want the, the world order to be our way and not uh, somebody else's way so i think i think we should um, uh, try to keep it not go back and say dismiss it but um, uh, try to solve the problems. Uh, of course as carl heinz mentioned there are many drawbacks now maybe uh, some things are um, a bit away from modern times, from modern um, economies, how they have uh, developed. But um, we should try to develop the system rather than, you know, leave it aside. Um, turning to climate change, I think this is, if I said national security is a, is in a market failure, then climate change is a, is a market failure and it's a global one. So. Uh, it's also not enough for one country um, to have political will to solve it. It has to be international agreement because otherwise it, it's just impossible to solve. And um, it's, it's 
really welcome that uh, um, President Biden has a bit different views than, than the previous administration. So it's a, at least a good step forward. But um, in general, I think it will be very, uh, very difficult to, to make an agreement on climate change, which, will, which would be really effective meaning that it has to be really binding, having consequences for countries not sticking to the targets. And um, I think um, it will take uh, probably until we feel very, very strong, real consequences from climate change affecting our economies, affecting our normal lives, like the pandemics. Uh, and that will force into, into really uh, strong political will to, to decide on this and to, to make international agreements on this issue. Very good. Um, I, I, I certainly uh, hope that we can play a part in helping foster that dialogue. Marjorie, I'm going to turn to you with uh, a two-part question because you're going to be our pivot from the broader to the narrower. So <laughs> um, love your thoughts on US-EU cooperation on the multilateral forum, whether it's WTO, climate change, and then get into maybe some of the specifics about US-EU trade mm -hmm. and where we might be able to have some early harvest potentially and where some of the challenges may be coming up in the year ahead. Sure. So uh, it may not surprise you that I agree uh, pretty vehemently with both Carl Heinz and Katrina that, that the WTO is a critical platform. Uh, both for negotiation and also for uh, dispute resolution. Uh, I also agree that uh, moving towards plurilateral agreements is probably the healthy way to go. Um, I mean, on the one hand, you've seen this proliferation of bilateral agreements. I would argue that, that those are important. Um, and it's also helpful, I think, to have as large a club as possible operating by the same set of rules. So, so I, would, I would think that um, a drive towards more plurilateral pacts is a good idea. Um, I do think that um, <clears throat> there is, I mean, we talked about China's entry. The, the practical reality is that, that uh, when there was discussion of China entering the, what became the WTO ditto with Russia, uh, there were those who said, this is a really bad idea because they're not gonna play by the rules. Um, and lo and behold, that's exactly what's happened. So the question then becomes, well, what can you do as far as rules uh, to, try to, to try to curb that behavior? And I think that you know, figuring out how to beef up rules related to state-owned enterprises is, um, is an area that we really have to delve further into. Now, there's a challenge because um, various countries have state-owned or state-controlled enterprises. Um, so it's not just a China issue, for example. You got to find a right way to, to deal with that. Um, but, but I do think it's something we have to, um, we have to address. Um, the, you know, the appellate body uh, issue. This was not a Trump administration issue. This is a concern that's existed in the U.S. for uh, at least a couple of administrations. Uh, uh, so as, as much as people like to pile on to the former president for uh, throwing a wrench into the international system, um, he, he was making good on, frankly, um, or, or trying to bring to the fore the concerns that had been shared previously. I do think there is, um, there is important work to be done here. I do think reforms are possible. Uh, there, there are the Walker principles that have been set on the table. I think that's probably uh, a good starting point. Um, so yeah, we, we do need to get that part of the, the dispute settlement arm uh, of, the, of the body um, functioning again. But I also think we can't lose sight of the negotiation uh, mandate of, um, uh, of the WTO. And there are negotiations ongoing that frankly have been going on too long. I mean, the fisheries agreement is what, two decades in the making. Um, that may seem like small fry uh, to us, but practically speaking, it's a very important uh, negotiation ditto with the environmental goods agreement. So I do think we have to make a concerted effort um, to, to get back to the negotiating table as well. You know, as far as climate change, I think, and I do agree, by the way, I agree with Carl Heinz that it's the US and Europe, and frankly, Canada and Japan, uh, the original quad, uh, that really need to be driving this effort. Um, as far as climate change, 
Uh, it's a global challenge. We're all part of the solution. Business certainly sees it that way. Uh, we think that, you know, uh, we support the efforts of governments to get together and try to find ways to mutually, um, to, to through their own actions and through mutual actions, to really confront the challenges aris arising by climate change. Um, from our perspective, it's important to ensure that policymakers are looking at uh, market-based solutions wherever possible, um, and, um, and and recognizing that you know you, you don't want to choke off um, innovation and growth, and it's the private sector that's act actually going to bring those technologies to the fore. Right? Some would argue that the technologies we really need. To, to cope with climate change and, and really drive our, our economies to net zero don't really exist yet. So the, the, the pledge is there, the desire is there, and obviously the administration is gonna make its, uh, you know, put forward its NDCs and so on, and we've got COP26 coming up, but, but the practical reality is that business has to have a role here. Um, and, um, uh, and that's a message that frankly, we've been communicating with the new administration. Apropos of the bilateral relationship, look, obviously the first thing we have to do is resolve the disputes we have. Um, we need to get Boeing, uh, sorry, the, the large civil aircraft subsidy uh, dispute uh, resolved. It's not a dispute between Boeing and Airbus. Um, we need to get that resolved. I do think there is goodwill uh, on the part of both the sides to actually find a way to do that. Uh, my understanding is that those conversations are going on. Uh, the question is, can they come up with uh, sort of a mutually acceptable way to, um, to manage subsidies uh, to the sector that will allow everybody to keep doing what they want to do, uh, but respecting uh, the rules of the road? Um, we've got to get the 232 tariffs, the Section 232 tariffs lifted, along with the European countermeasures. Um, you know, we obviously, there's the threat, obviously, of the European measures um, bumping up uh, later this year. We really want to avoid that. Um, it's, it's pretty obvious that I mean, there are those who will tell you that imposing the tariffs were important um, for a variety of reasons. There are plenty more people who would tell you that they've been a disaster. Um, our view is that you want to eliminate those trade distortions wherever you can. Uh, you've got to find a way, obviously, to, uh, to support domestic industry, uh, but I think there are ways to do that short of imposing tariffs. So we've got to get that resolved. We've got to get Privacy Shield um, uh, revised and, and underway. I think, you know, people talk about sort of the tech sector being in the, in the crosshairs of, um, of Europe right now. Every company is a tech company now, right? Everybody cares about data flows. So getting Privacy Shield right and preserving the ability of companies to use standard contractual clauses and other mechanisms is critically important. Uh, failure to do that, continuous challenges and uncertainty about the ability to allow free flows of data is, um, it is just, that's an economy killer for sure. Um, there are issues in the digital space that we do need to resolve. We need to get an agreement um, at the OECD uh, on taxation in the digital economy. Um, <clears throat> we, we can work together, I think, on climate and in the trade context, we can do, for example, I mentioned the environmental goods agreement. Um, likewise, there's a trade and health initiative that we could conceivably work on together. There is a lot that's grown out of the pandemic, uh, frankly, where there, there are opportunities that perhaps were there but hadn't really been brought to the fore for closer collaboration. I mean, there is no better example uh, of uh, the value of collaboration and coordination than the, the production of vaccines really in record time. So, so I do think there are some immediate things we have to address. Um, there are some uh, areas of, of, of um, coordination. Um, it, it is the three C's as the administration calls it, COVID, climate, and China. Um, uh, and there are some issues, I think, uh, policies in Europe that the business community, frankly, is concerned about. And the question is, can we sit down at the table and figure out how to iron out some of those differences? Uh, and it's for that reason that we certainly support the, um, the notion of a, of a US-EU Trade and Technology Council. I think we need a platform 
where pri the private sector has a, a, a voice, a serious voice, uh, but that gives us the opportunity to try to sort through uh, some of those differences and, and uh, collaborate where we can. Terrific. Uh, thank you so much, Marjorie. I uh, really appreciate you running through all that. So I'm going to invite um, Klaus Gramko back on to read some audience questions. But before uh, he gets to those questions, uh, Katrina, Carl Heinz, any thoughts on uh, the US-EU bilateral trade issues uh, that we uh, my, may, Marjorie may have missed or that you want to add on? Carl Heinz. Well, um, uh, uh, I think um, uh, we, we have problems on the table and the most obvious uh, problem uh, in the, um, uh, in the uh, bilateral trade relation is, uh, is uh, agriculture from the American uh, point of view. And obviously, um, uh, you know, I have been complaining a lot about Trump uh, uh, in the last hour and the heritage uh, of Trump, but, uh, you know, we have our own um, uh, protectionist agenda uh, in uh, Europe and notably in Germany. Uh, and uh, 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 pick agriculture, pick also uh, environmental questions, which are usually, uh, it's a kind of sports in Germany to use environmental issues as a, an entrance door, back door uh, for protectionism. So uh, these are all extremely complicated matter. But let me come back to my uh, the, the, the general thrust is simply that uh, uh, if there is a will, there will be a way. Um, uh, and the will has not been there. And we have learned lessons in the last few years that uh, uh, in the way, if we don't cooperate, we are driving against a wall. And uh, uh, this should now be the moment to really rethink this. Thank you. Thank you. Um I'm not sure if Katrina has any final thoughts before we go to questions, but I do want to remind our audience that the session is scheduled to go till 2.15 Eastern, so we are not running long. We are right on schedule. Uh, Klaus, any audience questions jump to the forefront that we haven't addressed already? Marjorie actually did a pretty good job uh, uh, knowing or not knowing uh, answer uh, most of the substantial <laughs> questions uh, about the future of EU America relations and you know the, the whole question of tariffs in the the Air, Boeing Airbus dispute uh, in in the section 232 I think you did a great job uh, of answering um, I have um, one, two issues, uh, I think that also the climate issue, I think you covered pretty well, but there are two questions that are, uh, uh, are interesting. And one of them uh, actually, uh, you know, Joe, Joe, uh, President Biden brought up in, in the debate in Europe, and this is how do you see the digital service tax issue playing out between the EU and US? Uh, and of course, President Biden said there should be an international uh, corporate tax, you know, uh, system. Uh, 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 and, and is this something that can be uh, reconciled with the U.S. notably targeted by the digital service tax? I think that's for for uh, all the uh, participants, uh, the panelists. But one, I think, specifically to Karl Heinz is my Chancellor Merkel's successor and the new German government that emerged from Germany's September election tried to take stronger action towards China as German industry seems to be calling for. I'm not quite sure if they are calling for it, but uh, that is a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I think from, for, 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 for Germans, the European question we have and, and climate we have too. So uh, uh, I think the, 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 the International corporate tax question and the digital tax question is 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 one that uh, I, we haven't covered yet. Well, I'm happy to jump in on the digital tax um, to say that uh, uh, it has long been our view that unilateral tax measures, such as the ones that have been adopted in places like the UK and France and Austria uh, and Italy, um, are a bad idea. Uh, and they are especially a bad idea 
because they clearly uh, target, without saying, but clearly target uh, American companies. Um, and so, it, which, you know, they're discriminatory. Uh, and so we would argue um, sort of violative of the, the norms, if not the letter uh, of the WTO. We do have this process in, in Paris at the OECD. It is, a, it is a robust process. It's one granted where uh, the last administration uh, dragged its heels somewhat. And as a result, we lost some time. Clearly this administration has indicated that it will um, move in a different direction. Now, I'm not gonna opine on the proposal that Secretary Yellen put out last week. We obviously don't know enough details about it. Um, but, but I will say what concerns us is, as far as Europe goes is that <clears throat> uh, this, this, this notion that uh, even if the OECD process uh, comes to fruition and there is an agreement that Europe may, because of its own internal pressures and the need to find revenues to support its recovery effort, may decide to proceed with a digital levy, whether a digital services tax or something else, uh, regardless of what is agreed um, at the OECD. That's problematic for us. Um, it's also problematic if, uh, if the countries, not just in Europe, but elsewhere that have adopted these taxes um, decide, well, we're just gonna keep them as is and, and don't necessarily take into account what might be agreed at the OECD. So, so for us, it's really a matter of, um, you know, avoiding the imposition of, um, uh, of unilateral discriminatory measures and making sure that we come to um, uh, a multilateral agreement, which is clearly uh, the best in, in everybody's best interest. I may uh, jump in uh, uh, with respect to the question on Germany's position in the future <laughs> um, with respect to China. This is, of course, pure speculation. We have general elections in September and afterwards we know what's going to happen. But let's assume, and that may not be unrealistic, that uh, we will not have a grand coalition uh, of Christian Democrats and Social Democrats anymore. But another combination, uh, and the most likely may be what we call a Jamaica coalition in Germany, uh, which is uh, uh, the Christian Democrats, uh, the Liberals, uh, and the Greens. Um, if that is the case, I think we're going to get a shift towards a tougher uh, position vis-a-vis uh, uh, -vis China. Because oddly enough, although the Greens and the Liberals quarrel on many issues, <laughs> they do not uh, uh, have a, a big of a difference opinion, a different opinion on China. They are both very critical uh, uh, with respect to the treatment of the Uyghurs, for instance, the treat, uh, for example, um, the treatment of Hong Kong, the treatment of Taiwan, and many other issues. And the Christian Democratic uh, Chancellor, if it were one, uh, would uh, would certainly shift uh, um, towards uh, a more critical position vis-a-vis -vis China. So uh, that would might make uh, things easier. Uh, in a coordinated action, for a coordinated action uh, transatlantically uh, with the Americans vis-a-vis uh, -vis China. Uh, on the other hand, there are many other issues uh, where we may have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, further difficulties, notably uh, with respect to uh, the green position uh, on trade negotiations, because uh, um, uh, they are really, uh, really res uh, very restrictive on uh, trade agreements, uh, at least what their program says at the moment, uh, that they have put on the table recently. So, uh, uh, a lot of speculation in that, but uh, with respect to China, I might expect uh, a, a tougher position of uh, the German government. Uh, Katrina, I wanted to ask you one special question, since we have you here uh from vilnius and this is one issue we haven't really talked about obviously because i think we have a feeling that the economy is not that strong it's russia how is the feeling in your region about what putin does of course in question of security but also in the question of of maybe 
putting economic uh, pressure uh, uh, on the Baltic uh, states. And you know, one of the big issues we also haven't talked about uh, is is uh, uh, the the pipeline, uh, which is of course here in Washington a huge issue. Which Germans and Europeans who are come to Washington are completely surprised, and it's bipartisan. I mean, if there was an, uh, uh, an uh, if there was a bipartisan issue in the last four years, it was Nord Stream two. So what? You, so so what's the what's the view in, in your country and your region about this and and about the role of that Russia plays? So yeah, of course, in within European Union, we are we are the ones um, opposing the the pipeline very strongly, and uh, here we we disagree also with with our other European partners, and we're glad to hear uh, uh, the U.S. supporting our position, and uh, and uh, it was it was a pleasure to hear um, President Biden naming uh, the right name <laughs> to President Putin. Uh, so definitely Russia will use any opportunity uh, it, it is given, uh, any opportunity to, to divide uh, Western countries, to, uh, to divide European countries, uh, to make them disagree um, on, on certain issues. And um, uh, yeah, as I said, we, um, I think we see more strongly the, the threats coming from Russia, and uh, of course we would vote for um, having perhaps less economic benefit, but uh, but uh, taking care of uh, of security issues with respect to Russia. I may add one sentence uh, that uh, I think Nord Stream is a very good example to show that the, the, the general opinion is shifting, is becoming more critical. If we had to decide on North Stream today uh, again, I'm not sure whether North Stream would come. But the argument uh, fundamentally by many uh, people uh, in Germany is of course that we have invested so much already, so we are locked in. It's not a good argument, I personally think, uh, but uh, we are locked in uh, and uh, uh, therefore we have to continue. But the public opinion has gradually shifted away from it. It reminds me, Carl Heinz, when I worked in uh, corporate life, um, the company I worked for invested $2 billion in the Windows XP system and before it was even rolled out by the company, Windows 10 was rolled out. Yet because they had spent $2 yeah, billion yeah. Dollars on Windows XP, that company still today in 2021 is using Windows XP, <laughs> even though the rest of the world has been on Windows 10 for uh, a decade. Yeah. It's I, you know, crazy. Uh, <laughs> one should act on bygones are bygones, as uh, the saying uh, goes in financial markets. But that's not the way politics works. I'll let you folks look at my LinkedIn and figure out what company that was. Um, but we'll invite Thomas Ilka to come on the screen. Thomas is the uh, regional director of the European Dialogue, Friedrich Naumann Foundation, uh, leading their dialogue activities across Europe. Uh, uh, Thomas, uh, thank you for joining us and you're gonna bring us to a close today. Yeah, thank you, Ken, and uh, big thanks uh, for every one of you uh, on the panel and for the questions uh, from those who uh, watched us. Uh, what a discussion. I mean, you uh, really walked us through the theory, the politics and the practicalities uh, of uh, uh, um, the trade uh, issues uh, worldwide, globally. And uh, of course, I won't dare to, to summarize anything, but uh, I put down uh, three main takeaways I have uh, uh, with me today. And number one, of course, is uh, that the security issues is back as a mighty theme on the table uh, of trade. And uh, number two even relates from number one, and uh, that is that we should make uh, trade politics uh, smart and even tough and not naive to cope uh, with uh, the questions uh, which are uh, at hand. And the third one, the third main takeaway for me today is uh, maybe an easy one, uh, but can't be stressed enough, and that is. Uh, uh, the importance of international organizations. 
uh, to keep the ball rolling, uh, to build trust and uh, to spread the word uh, of what trade can do uh, as a uh, development instrument, as a peacekeeping instrument and uh, many more. So and the bottom line, of course, of all those three um, issues is twofold. In all those three issues, there's one question, what to do with China? And the second thing is when we want to keep the ball rolling, when we want to uh, be uh, effective in the sense uh, we hope to be effective in, we need to partner with the US, the EU, uh, you mentioned uh, Japan, and there are some others uh, which can stick together um, to use every uh, angle we have to use uh, uh, every uh, power, every might uh, we have at our hands to push uh, the issue of international trade and its benefit uh, forward. So dialogue is uh, uh, needed, make it construct constructive, build a strong case uh, for EU, US plus, uh, plus others alliance on that. And uh, I think we can really uh, make things uh, happen. And with that, uh, thanks a lot. And back to you, Ken. Thank you so very, very much. Uh, thank you to the Friedrich Naumann Foundation for uh, helping organize today's event, for co-hosting today's event, Tomas, Klaus, Carl Heinz. Katrina, it's a pleasure to have met you uh, electronically this way. We hope to host you in Washington, or maybe you have a chance to visit you in the Garden Hotspot of Vilnius sometime in the future. Marjorie, uh, you and I will be hopefully sharing a burger sometime soon um, uh, when we're both fully vaccinated. Uh, thank you all for watching today and for joining us. Um, reminder that tomorrow morning, bright and early at 9.30 a.m., WIDA is hosting a discussion of U.S. trade with Central America and related immigration issues. And next week, we have an event on trade and the environment where we'll be bringing someone to us from Auckland, New Zealand, uh, live for that session. So um, the benefits of doing these global webinars where we can bring people from around the world together. Thank you again, Marjorie. Carl Heinz, Katrina, Tomas, and Klaus, everyone out there, take care of yourself, be safe, and make sure you get the shot as soon as it's available to you. Thank you. Thank you, Ken. Thank you, Ken.